Greetings, everyone. My name is Jeremy Smith. I'm with the Los Alamos Creative District. Thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, thanks to the Los Alamos Historical Society for putting on tonight's History on Tap. I do have next week coming up, Science on Tap. Uh, we partner with the Bradbury Science Museum for that. And it looks like uh, the topic is going to be image consultant, machine learning, expert studies, how computers and humans perceive photos differently. So that's next week, next Monday, December 14th, also at 5.30, also uh, virtual. So uh, sign up for that. You can get the information either through the Creative District or through the Science Bradbury Museum website as well. And if you would like more information about the ONTAP series, we've got Nature on Tap, History on Tap, Science on Tap, and Culture on Tap. You can sign up for our newsletters through the Creative District website creativelosalamos.com. Also in January, I've got the Culture on Tap, January 25th. Uh, that topic has yet to be determined, but I just had a thought. If anybody knows of a good connection with the Hill Stompers, I'd love to highlight their 20th anniversary. Actually, Jeff, I see you're on here, so uh, shoot me a text. Maybe we can um, sort that out January 25th. Uh, maybe we'll be talking about the Hill Stompers, 20 years of stomping around the hills. Um, so once again, my name is Jeremy Smith with the Los Alamos Creative District, and thanks for joining us. Amy, back to you. Yeah. So thank you all uh, for being here for History on Tap. My name is Amy. I'm the museum educator for the Los Alamos Historical Society. Um, it is great to see so many of you here for a virtual History on Tap. And we're really excited tonight um, to have Marlon Magdalena as our presenter. Uh, he's an artist and educator, and he's the uh, instructional coordinator at Hemis Historic Site. And so he'll be leading a discussion tonight on um, Native American flutes. So I will hand it over to you, Marlon. Thank you so much for being here. All right, thanks, Amy. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, so I'll just go ahead and um, I guess just give a brief introduction as to who I am and maybe how I got into the flutes. Uh, so uh, again, my name is Marlon Magdalena. I'm from the Pueblo of Hamas. And uh, I am an educator at the Hamas Historic Site, which is in Hamas Springs. Um, some of you may have been there before. Um, I've been there since 2005. Uh, started off as, an, as a ranger. Uh, I am the instructional coordinator there now. And so uh, my job is to uh, educate the public about the Hamas Historic Site and about where I'm from, uh, the Pueblo of Hamas, and just about us and Pueblo people in general, uh, and a whole bunch of other topics. Uh, one of those topics happens to be Native American flutes. Um, I got into flutes back in uh, 2007, um, and I bought my first flute. And since then, I've just researched more. I started uh, making my own flutes as well. So I'll show uh, some flutes from my collection that I've made and uh, the other flutes, uh, most of my flutes are from other makers. Uh, so I'll <clears throat> uh, talk a little bit about them and uh, their history and uh, their construction, uh, how they're made and how they're played, because they're not all the same uh, type of flute. So <clears throat> um, I guess I'll do this kind of chronologically on how I learned them. Uh, the, the first type of flute that I uh, remember hearing or uh, purchasing is uh, it's called a Native American flute or or a Native American style flute. Now, if you're into Native American flute music, if you've listened to, I know somebody mentioned uh, Carlos Nakai, um, and there's other uh, famous flute players that you may have heard as well, but the flutes that they're using are this type of flute, Native American flute or Native American style flute. Um, but as I learned, started learning more and more, that's sort of a, a misnomer. Um, so if you have a chance, uh, go, to, to, go to my website, marlonmagdalena.com, uh, and I've put this information on there. And a lot of the information that I'll tell you today is on my website, um, at least a brief history. Um, and so the, uh, the Native American flute, like I said, is a misnomer because... Native American is a very broad, generic term, and 
here in the United States, there's over 500, uh, or there used to be more than 500 tribes, and now I think there's a little over 300 uh, federally recognized tribes. Um, and each one probably had their own type of flutes. And here in the Southwest, there, and that's, that's the case here, there's not just one type of flute. Uh, so the flute that you hear, um, I've come to call it the two-chambered block flute, basically showing uh, or just describing how it works. Uh, so that'll be the first flute that I'll, I'll, I'll show you. And I have some examples here. And uh, those are the types of flutes that I have the most of. Um, so I guess I'll just grab the first one here. Uh, now, they can be very simple. Uh, this one here kind of has many different pieces of wood uh, in this particular flute. You know, there's a darker wood here, which is mahogany. This wood here, I think, is a, a blood wood. This wood here is camphor. So I don't know if you've seen camphor wood or smelt camphor wood. It's got this really strong smell. Uh, and then see this top part here. Now, this is the reason why it's called a, a block flute. This little piece of wood moves around. And it can be any shape as long as it's flat on the bottom. You can see there. And there's actually a little windway here. I don't know if you can actually see it. Um, and I do have diagrams of these flutes on my website. So if you don't understand what I'm uh, saying, I do have those diagrams there for each type of flute. So this is a two chambered block flute. Now, this is the block, and there's two chambers. So this one here is the sound chamber. Uh, and this one here, there's actually a chamber in here. Uh, that's the first chamber. That's what's called the slow air chamber. So what's happening with this flute is when you blow into the mouthpiece here, into this hole, the air travels this way, and there's a little section here that's been left. And the air stops there, and it travels up underneath the block and out this hole and on, onto the what's called the fipple. That's the blowing edge. That's what vibrates and produces the sound. So this flute is very easy to learn. You can see it has six holes. Uh, a lot of the modern type like this are, are tuned to a very easy type of scale, a, a pentatonic scale, where there's five notes that are very easy and they sound uh, good together. Uh, so you can basically come up with any pattern and come up with a very simple song. Okay, so it's very easy for uh, improvising. Um, and since there's only five notes in that basic scale, it's very easy to memorize uh, a song. Um, now the flutes before this, uh, before they were modernized and standardized, they didn't follow any Western scale, any Western notation. Because people in the past, didn't, we didn't have that before uh, Europeans brought it. And so those flutes didn't have any specific scale. Uh, so they sound a lot different to modern ears. Uh, so what happened was, is people be wanted to play with other instruments or they wanted to be in tune to some sort of scale. Uh, so these are very good for playing with other instruments like a guitar or a piano. Uh, so that's why they're very popular uh, with a lot of musicians um, and with just people that just want to uh, just to meditate with this. It, it can be a solo instrument and you don't have to be a performer or go out and perform for people, which, which I do. Uh, you can just play it inside your house or in the forest or wherever uh, just to make just to make simple music. And it's very calming, too. Uh, there are some flutes that are in this key, which is an F sharp, uh, F sharp minor, uh, that pentatonic is, is the minor scale. Uh, so this is an F sharp, and then it, they can get higher, they can get smaller. Uh, this one here, it's made out of reed, and it's in C sharp. So it's going to be a, a lot higher, uh, higher pitch. So actually, some of the very first types of flutes are made out of bamboo or reed because that material is hollow. It's very easy to 
clean out and open up the nodes, the sections of the bamboo or the reed. Now, this here is a very good example of what they look like inside and why they're made a certain way, like the one I was just showing you. The reason why there's a little section inside of this flute is because that's what bamboo looks like on the inside. Okay, so this one's not, it's pretty tight here, but the section's still inside. So uh, this section here, I had to remove because it will mess with the tuning. But this one here, you keep intact. And so you have this chamber where you blow the air through and that little node in the inside just allows the air to travel past through that tiny hole. And this is where the sounds made. So it's like a, like a recorder. Uh, I'm sure we're, we've all seen recorders before, probably mostly the, the cheap plastic ones that sometimes parents buy the little kids. Uh, but it's essentially the same idea. You, you blow into the top, you produce the sound. Um, and then if you really want to learn how to play them, there's that technique involved of blowing very softly. That's your embouchure. You know, it has to be covered all, you have to cover that hole on the top here so no air comes out. And all you have to do is just hold all the holes down. You start from the bottom up. And so you're essentially with the flutes, and if you're not really familiar with flutes, the bottom hole, that's the, the fundamental. That's the very first note. And as you open the holes, that's uh, that follows that certain scale. Um, and then I have a chart, which I haven't really memorized, but uh, C sharp will have a particular note that goes next. Um, it's actually behind me. I don't know if you can see it. It's on the wall. But that's the, that's the chart that I use if I'm tuning flutes. And it's for two different types of flutes. It's one's for this flute and one's for another flute, which I'll, I'll mention in, in a little bit. Uh, so essentially, you're making the flute shorter as you're opening holes. So it's becoming a smaller flute as you open holes. And that goes for many instruments as well. Uh, uh, wind, I guess woodwinds. You're essentially making the flute shorter. Uh, now this one <clears throat> is another type of flute, which I, I won't really mention yet, but it can, you can see that you've left, or that I've left that node on the inside. So this one's a very interesting type of flute, which is what, what, is, which is what I call a uh, Oodam flute. Now the Oodam people are from Southern Arizona, and they have a flute just like this, with three holes like this here. And the way you make it work is essentially your finger becomes the block. So you're covering this hole here. So this is kind of uh, on the shorter end of this type of flute, but it's a very good example and it's easy to travel around with since it's not as long as some of these, some of the originals, which I actually have one here. This one, um, I don't remember how long this is, uh, a little over two feet, but it's essentially the same flute that I just played. It's got three holes and the sound hole here. So since it's bigger, it's got a, a lower sound. So the smaller the flute, the higher the sound or the pitch or the higher the key, or, and then the longer the flutes, the bigger the flutes, the lower the key, the lower the sound's gonna be. So I have some other block flutes here. I actually have some. Uh, now the one I showed, showed you first was made just last year, 2019. Now this flute here was probably made in the 70s or 80s. I'm not exactly sure when. Uh, it was made by a Lakota man uh, his name is uh, Richard Fulbull, and you can probably find some information about him uh, on the internet. Uh, but this is a flute that's not tuned to any scale, but it's pretty close to a, to the uh, the pentatonic minor scale. And I think this is one of those flutes that they based off that the modern scale from, uh, just because this sounded 
pretty decent uh, in terms of the scale to to modern ears. And it's very nice sounding flute too. I, I and uh, just a quick story about this. I uh, I got this off of eBay, and the person or the people that were selling it, it was a uh, uh, not a pawn shop, or I guess it could have been a pawn shop. But anyways, they're selling this flute on eBay, but they didn't really know anything about it. So I got it for a really low price. Then somebody that knew what it was probably would have sold it for a lot more. So I got lucky. Uh, the only thing I had to fix was this this piece of wood the block was missing so i had to make one and it's what that guy would have made what richard fulbo would have made the same style and uh this year i added for decor decorative purposes these are eagle feathers uh, which i add to a lot of my flutes and i'll show you some of those other ones uh, so this is an older type of scale uh this is also an older type of scale uh, but it's more of a it's a modern replica See, these holes here on the bottom are what are called the uh, tuning holes. Uh, people are, you use these to tune that fundamental note, the bottom note with all the holes closed. Uh, so if you want a particular key, if you want it in A, you close all the holes and then you would tune it. Uh, and if it was kind of flat from A, you open these holes, make them a little bit bigger to get to the key of A. Then if you make it too big, and then the, the note's going to go sharp. It's going to be too high. Uh, and this one, doesn't, uh, this one also doesn't have a particular scale. This one's more of uh, the same type of scale that I just played. But it's pretty close to uh, that minor pentatonic. Uh, so I'll show you some of the ones that I've made here. Um, this one here is made out of yucca stock. Um, you may be familiar with uh, soap tree yucca. Uh, soap tree yucca grows naturally here in New Mexico, but in southern New Mexico. Uh, but people do use it in their landscaping. Uh, so some of you may have soap tree yuccas outside your in your yard. Uh, this particular yucca I actually got from Coronado Historic Site in Bernalillo. If you've ever been there, there's uh, these really big soap tree yuccas uh, outside of the museum at Coronado. And so I was able to use that yucca stock to make this flute. It's in the key of G, G minor. Um, got a mallard head carved on the bottom. Some big tuning holes. This one's in the shape of a cloud. And you see there's mountains here. Um, I don't really mention these, but I don't know if you can see the two lines on top of the mountains. Um, those are, uh, what are they called? Lenticular clouds. Uh, they kind of look like UFOs up in the sky, but but these are right on the mountains. Uh, at least that's my interpretation of it. Uh, these, this is actually a pottery design from Hamus uh, Black and White. So you see the holes, different zigzags, which represent lightning bolts all the way around and as a block. It's got two pieces of wood and a little, little stone on the top. See that there? Yeah. Well, that's one of my flutes. Um, when, I, I don't have a lot of my flutes because when I make them, I make them either for to order or for order you know somebody orders of flutes or to sell uh this one here i have for sale but no one bought it to, and so i decided to keep it for myself and i've used it many times for uh, for my performances and it's also a good one to show people what all well, basically what i can do uh, the type of artwork i can make uh into a flute now this is another one that i made out of river cane. Now this river cane came from, uh, I want to say Arkansas or Kentucky, somewhere around there. I don't. Remember. I think Kentucky uh, grows naturally out there. American river cane. 
and I did all these designs with the blowtorch, create all the different swirls. And this block is made out of birch. And you can see on the top, I've inlaid turquoise and red clay. That's what's on the top. Now this one is one of my first flutes. I actually made this back in 2009. So I started making flutes in 2008. Um, so this one, it kind of got big on me here on the top, uh, just because uh, the tuning was a little off, so I had to compensate. So sometimes if they can get too big, uh, so that's why I kept them. I I'm able to play them. Uh, I think somebody had a question there. Uh, yeah, so the, the question um, is, do you know how big hole? you can make the hold in the last flute that you made out of yucca? Okay, so what, I don't know which hole you're talking about. Maybe the, the tuning hole? Possibly the two? tuning hole. Yeah, it could be this one. Yeah, okay, yeah, so... Yes, the tuning um, holes. So the tuning holes are essentially, they, they can get to a certain point, And then after they get to a certain point, uh, it doesn't really matter how big they are. Because uh, what those tuning holes are doing, they're essentially making that flute shorter without cutting off and making the flute actually shorter. Uh, so you see a lot of these bird heads, uh, bird head flutes with tuning holes. Uh, now with this one, I kind of went just different. Instead of just rounds, uh, I decided just to make them a little bit different. Uh, and there's actually some tuning holes where these dots are. They're kind of camouflaged uh, because this was actually tuned to a different key before, and I wanted to bring it to a little higher note or a higher key. So I had to add more tuning holes, same size here. So you can't really tell unless you're really looking, but there's a lot of tuning holes under here to get it to a G. So those are a few of the block flutes. And uh, uh, once I started learning more about them, started making more, and I, I, at the same time, I'm researching other types of flutes. Uh, and most of this research is on the internet. Uh, there's some a really good source. Uh, it's called the flutopedia.com, I think. Uh, but I have it on my website. There's a, a page on my website that has uh, links to many of these places. Uh, flutopedia should be linked on there. But if you just look up flutopedia, there's a lot of information and a lot of sources too. Um, so there and other places I started to learn about older styles of flutes, flutes that existed here in the Southwest, in New Mexico, a lot longer possibly than those block flutes that I, sh uh, I showed you. Now those flutes were rim blown flutes and bone flutes. Uh, so I st actually started making uh, rim blowns about the same time I started making in 2008. Uh, I have one here, most of the other ones I've sold, but this one here I made in September of 2008, um, it's one of my first rim blowns, and it's made out of bamboo. Now, bamboo is a very good material. Uh, it, it lasts a long time. It ha it's, it's prone to cracking, but there's certain ways you can help that out. This right here is actually cordage uh, that I've wrapped around. It's called binding to prevent it from expanding and cracking. There's some more up here and right here. And so with these flutes, um, they're a lot older. Um, in, in Arizona, back in the 1930s, uh, Earl Morris, an early archaeologist, uh, found these flutes in a cave. And they named it Broken Flute Cave because they found four flutes and uh, other, other uh, artifacts as well, even some human remains. <clears throat> and those four flutes are currently in, at the Arizona State Museum. And they're about 
27 inches to about 29 inches long, about inch diameter. And this one, I've added some painting to it, but they're all plain. Uh, they're more like this one. Let's see if I can. So this one's about 29 inches long. It's, it's actually one of my newer ones. It's actually a replica that uh, I got asked to make because uh, somebody's making a film that dates back to this time. So they wanted a replica of those flutes. Uh, so this one actually doesn't work. It's just made to look like a flute. Uh, so there's a hole up here, but it only goes to about here. This hole only goes to about here. So it's only made to, to look like it because they weren't actually going to play it in the movie. They just needed something that looks like it. Uh, but luckily, I have this one. Now, the hard thing with these flutes is that uh, is the embouchure. How do you play these flutes? Um, so it also leads me to my theory of why we don't really see them anymore. Uh, they're very hard to play. And once we start losing the knowledge of how to play these flutes, no one's going to pass it down. Uh, and so what happens, at least in some pueblos, is other flutes come into, into to, to their attention. Some flutes that are easier to play. So what's going to happen is they're going to choose the flute that's easier to play because the sound is what in, what's important. Um, and, and I'll get into that a little bit later too about why we play flutes uh, so i had to figure out how to play this and so like i said i didn't really have a lot to go on you can't just can't just blow into them because they're basically just hollow tubes with the slight uh sharpened edge up on top and so at first i actually had a, a notch which is what that red is and i filled this notch in later because the notch Sometimes it'll help if you're playing it like this, which I can play with a flat rim, but if it had the notch there, it'd probably be a little bit louder. Um, but these flutes weren't made like that. They were made with a flat rim. So I started looking for other flutes, not just here, but throughout the world and figuring out, well, what other flutes are like that? And so I came across the Egyptian Ney which I have a small version here. This is a small Egyptian name made from reed from the Nile. And you can see it's got the same rim. And these flutes have been around for a long time since ancient Egypt. The ancient Egyptians played this type of flute. It has six holes and one on the back. Uh, but they just have a, a longer tradition of playing them. So the way to play this is called the oblique technique or the side blowing technique. So it's a little bit harder to play this one because I haven't practiced much with this nay. It's just a really small diameter, but they do make them bigger. Uh, but even those, they're really, they're, they're really long and kind of awkward to hold uh, just because you know, I didn't grow up learning this type of flute and my arms aren't very flexible. Uh, but that's just the Egyptian nay. It helped me with the technique. So I was able to use that technique uh, onto this uh, rim blown flute. Um, so I call them Pueblo style because they've been in use for a long time. A lot of Pueblos used to use these up until the 19th century or the 20th century, early 1900s. And so this is that same technique. So it's very easy to control. You can start off with the really no, uh, the low sound. And then just by making your embouchure tighter, you can jump up to the next uh, register.
Yeah. So about four different registers you could go. I think I can go to a fifth, but be really high. Um, so that's the technique that I've learned for this. So then I started learning about, or I found other types of nags. And I came across the Persian nay, which I have one here. It's also made from reed. So Persian nays come from Iran. Uh, they're almost the same as an Egyptian nay, except uh, Persian nay doesn't have this hole here. It's only got five on front, but there's still one on the back. And a lot of the professional ones that you'll that I found are made out of brass. They have a brass insert on top. This one's made out of plastic. Because what happens with the brass and with this technique is this part of the flute goes in between the two front teeth like this. And so what was happening with the brass is it kind of just tore away at the teeth. So I guess a lot of Persian nay players will have a, a big gap uh, in their teeth. Um, so the plastic helps with that, but there's still a pretty fairly difficult flute to make, to get a sound out of. <sighs> And it's a little bit more airier too. I just haven't had much practice with this. Um, but that technique works really well with the rim blown. This one here. So it's another technique that I like using too. And it, uh, it vibrates a lot more. Uh, you can feel it in your chest area when you just that first note. That's why I like using that technique for just kind of meditative purposes. Um, and I think that's the way that these flutes were, would have been used. Um, there's been some uh, flute paintings made by Pueblo people back in the 60s and 70s uh, that show people or those flute players kind of heard it uh, holding it vertically and those flutes are most likely uh, rim blooms just like this so they're playing with that technique uh, so those are rim blooms i do have two more here uh, this one's more of a replica of a of the one from broken flute cave it's about 29 inches and the diameter is about the same uh, so this one the first one it's kind of a little bit wider uh, it's just the bamboo that I had. Uh, so the narrower flutes are a little bit harder to play just because they're really narrow. But I can use those same techniques on, on this one too. And this one's also made out of bamboo, but a slightly different type of bamboo than that first one. Um, I think this one I got from a uh, tiki torch that I found at Walmart. Uh, so I don't even know where this bamboo came from, but uh, it worked out nice. This one, this one I actually got from Dollar Tree. Uh, I think it was meant to be a, a stake for tomato plants put in the ground to keep them steady. Uh, but it made a really nice flute. Uh, this is another rim blown flute. It's only 13 inches long, and it's a replica of a one found in uh, Utah, in southern Utah, in Grand Gulch. And it's also a rim blown, uh, but it's only got four holes. So most of the rim blowns are like that. Uh, some of the modern, I guess, more modern than these ones, because a lot of those, uh, the ones from Broken Flute Cave date back to the 600s to the 800s, uh, basket maker times. And this one from Grand Gulch, I believe, was uh, dated to around the 1100s. <clears throat> uh, now, some of the... The more modern ones date back to the early 1900s. Uh, there's a Hamas flute that was, you know, 
bought from somebody during those times, uh, an early ethnographer. They, 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 they bought a lot of things. Uh, they, want, they bought one that just looked just like this one here. Uh, the, that Hamas flute was made out of reed. And it had three nodes, just like this, and four holes, just like this. It was also a rim blown. Uh, so it would have been played with, with the other ones as well. That, that comment um, says, um, I've got a flute, maybe bamboo, um, with what looks like tuning holes at the bottom. I bought it at Red Rocks 20 plus years ago. The name on it is Paul Thompson. Oh, yeah, Paul Thompson. Yeah, I have a flute of his, too. Um, I think he still lives in Albuquerque, but he's another flute maker. He's been making flutes for a long time. Um, I don't know if it's bamboo. I guess I'll have to see it. Um, but you can tell what bamboo looks like, it, or, or, or maybe you can't. Uh, so Joanne's um, holding it up to the camera now, if you can see it, um, Marlon, in, um, if you want to switch to gallery view. Uh, yeah, that looks like bamboo, or it could be reed. But yeah, it look, definitely looks like uh, bamboo. Uh, so bamboo, there's about, uh, this question here, bamboo, there's about, uh, I think, 40 different species of bamboo in Mexico alone, uh, and probably more throughout Mesoamerica. And they probably would have brought it up through trade. Um, and it probably wouldn't survive very long. Uh, so... I only use bamboo because it's easy to make flutes out of. And if I mess up, I didn't spend a whole lot of time making a flute that ended up breaking. Uh, so bamboo is very cost effective. If you can find the bamboo, um, you can find sources of it on the internet. Uh, but most of these flutes are made out of uh, local material. Uh, now, there's some that have been found in Chaco Canyon that the people that found them say they're made out of cottonwood. The Broken Flute Caves, they say, it was made out of box elder. But looking at all those types of wood, I, I, to me, I don't think they were made out of those wood. Um, and I don't know how they tested the, the wood those flutes were made out of. But the closest thing and the easiest wood that I've worked with is elderberry. And I'm still on the lookout for elderberry. And I know from, I think, uh, what website? The Peak website, I think kind of has a, a a function where you can go to to find out where certain trees are and apparently there's elderberry that grows kind of uh, uh southwest of los alamos so i still have to go to that trail to where elderberry is because elderberry if you've never worked with that wood there's a soft inside. It's a soft pith that's very easy to take out and hollow and make into a flute. Uh, so that's just one of my theories, which I still have to find that elderberry. Um, and just really Where's quick, here, uh, this is a, a Hopi flute. Now, Hopi people make, and they possibly still make them. I'm not too sure. Uh, I, I know some Hopi people, but I haven't asked. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of pictures of Hopi uh, flute ceremonies back in the early 1900s and they have flutes and they have five holes just like this this is a replica and you can see a lot of them in, in those pictures those very old pic black and white pictures they're, they they kind of look like they're using that uh the interdental technique that i i showed you earlier um, and those flutes and a lot of pueblo style flutes have an attachment just like this one here, a little gourd attachment, uh, which you could e either represent flowers or rain clouds, depending. And if it's held vertically, they're definitely rain clouds. And there's usually feathers attached. Uh, this one here, this maker just attached some uh, parrot feathers because these you can sell. You can't sell eagle feathers or any other migratory bird. But that's just an example of the attachment that go that would have went on a Pueblo style of flute. And what was the question? Uh, the question was, um, is yucca more durable long-term or less than bamboo? Uh, I'd say maybe longer. Uh, bamboo, if it's not in the right place, if it's left out too in, in a hot place for a very long period of time, it'll crack if there's no binding on it. But even with binding, uh, it'll crack. Uh, 
but if it does, it's very easy to fill in and fix. Um, and there's a other type of instrument. Somebody just mentioned shakuhachis, which I, I have a shakuhachi here, um, which I guess I could, it's just right here. Um, now shakuhachis are flutes from Japan and they also have a long history, but they're played a certain, a different way. You can see there's a notch that's a little bit different from the rim blown, but this is also a rim blown. It just has a different type and style of notch. Uh, but this one here had a crack. And then the maker or the owner tried to fix it with this binding right here. But then to reinforce it, I've added these bindings here to keep it from expanding and cracking. Uh, but bamboo does crack. And if it's thick, the, the cracks don't really affect how it plays. Uh, it's just how bamboo works. Uh, but even wood, if, if you're playing it out at night, at this time of the year, the warm breath is going to cause the really cold flute to expand too fast, and then it's going to crack. Uh, and so then you'll either have to stop or then you have to see if you can fix it. Uh, but usually cracks are fixable. Um, nowadays, especially with super glue, uh, shakuhachis, since they're bamboo, there's a certain way you have to fix those, uh, which I won't really get into. Uh, so somebody had just asked how I hollow them out. Uh, so bamboo, of course, is already hollow. And if I need to take out a node, a little section, I use a really long drill bit. Uh, you can de definitely use an arrow, but there's really long dr drill bits that you can get at a uh, hardware store, or Home Depot or Lowe's. Now, the, the block flutes, or if I'm going to make a rim blown, uh, like this replica here, it's actually uh, two pieces of wood. So uh, if it's a branch, I split the branch in half, and I gouge out the center of each half with a gouge chisel. And a gouge chisel is is a semi a semicircle basically so you gouge out the inside and then you glue those two pieces together so a lot of flutes you'll actually be able to see the glue line of where it was glued together uh, but sometimes some of the uh, some of the other makers have more tools or different types of tools like this flute here doesn't have a glue line because it's made out of one solid piece of wood so they, they're actually capable of drilling with the long drill bit all the way through uh, to hollow out this piece of wood. I'm not yet capable of that. So I just don't have the, the space. Uh, uh, but it depends on the person too. Uh, I like using my hands and hand tools and making my flutes. Uh, and other people will just like using the tools if they have them. Um, they still sound nice. Uh, it doesn't really matter how they're made. Uh, a lot of the older types of flutes are probably made the same way using knives, carving knives. Just just takes a lot longer. Uh, and the glue that I use is just wood glue, tight bond wood glue. Um, some of the flutes from the 1800s, 1900s were actually glued together with pine pitch, um, and you can see just black lines. Uh, just because of the pine pitch that they just used to put together. And it, that's what they used, uh, which I guess will lead into my next flutes. And probably the last flute I'll talk about is the uh, bone flutes. And I have several here made from different materials. This one here is made out of a turkey tibio tarsus, which is the drumstick. See that there. And on the inside is pine pitch, pine pitch glue. That's the black stuff there. And this one actually cracked. Uh, so I had to fill in the crack with more pine pitch glue. And I put bindings on it with, with some very strong cordage to prevent further expansion and cracking. Um, I have some eagle bone flutes made out of eagle bone. This is my one of my recent ones. This is from a golden eagle. It's, it's from a mature golden eagle but it's not a very large, mature eagle. This is probably the male, because I believe uh, females are a little bit bigger than the males. 
This one I made from a mature bald eagle. It's probably the female, or it probably just ate a lot more than the male or this one. So you can see the, the different in size. They're, supposed, they're both mature eagles, uh, but this one's just a lot bigger, a little bit more white than this one. Uh, so I guess it kind of goes, uh, it depends on their diet, perhaps, on how big they get. Now, the turkey bone is white because of uh, where I got it. So they uh, they uh, use peroxide to clean the bone and to whiten it a little. That's the sound that they produce. Uh, this is the eagle bone. And here's the other one. So the smaller the flute is, the higher the pitch is going to be, and the bigger the flute is going, to, the higher the pitch is going to be. Same goes for the eagle bone. Uh, this one here is a slightly smaller one. It's actually the other side of this bone. Uh, they're from the same eagle. It's just that one's a little bit shorter than the other. So it produces a, a higher sound. Uh, and they're all made the same way uh, by putting some sort of material on the inside. Um, now, pitch glue is kind of a hard thing to make if you've never really made it. It's also hard to work with because you have to heat it up. You also have to warm up the bone so it's not cold, but it's not too hot because if it's too hot, it's going to break. It's going to just break in half. That's what happened with this one. If you can see, but I've repaired it right here because it had broken in half or it broke right here because I got it too hot. Uh, this is the glue. It's just a small piece. It's black, kind of looks like a rock. So you heat it up using a, a lighter or a, a, a candle just to get it hot and, and so that we can kind of just put it inside the hole. Uh, it's made from pinion sap, which I have a piece here. If you ever look at a pinion tree, you probably see a bunch of these small little things. That's the sap that's dried. So you crush that up. Mix it with either charcoal or ashes as a binder, and then you you heat it up. You melt it together, and that's what makes the glue. And it's very good for making the the, the inner part of this flute or uh, this whistle. It's another whistle. Um, and it's also used for uh, putting arrowheads onto arrows. It's a very uh, very very tough, very strong type of glue. Uh, I even have one here that's made out of copper uh, because bone is just like wood. If it gets too cold and you blow into it, it cracks. Some of these uh, eagle bone flutes have cracked on me, but they still work. Uh, but copper, uh, it's another way to make them and they still sound pretty good. Very good for uh, making bird sounds too. So we, I also have bird whistles, uh, just like this one here. It's made out of an eagle bone. And so that would have been used to uh, imitate uh, different types of birds, which uh, a lot of Pueblo people will use. We use a lot of bird feathers in our ceremony, so it's very good to to call them in as you're you're hunting uh, different types of birds. So I think that's uh, most of the flutes and whistles that I wanted to talk to you about. So I guess I can just if you have more questions, or if I missed any questions, I guess I can get to those questions too. I don't think that um, we've missed any, but anybody, if you have questions, um, please, like, oh, somebody says you're exciting our cat. I was kind of wondering that <laughs> with the bird whistles. <laughs> but yeah, um, if you haven't used the chat and you've got a question, there should be a button probably at the bottom or the top of your screen. Um, so please put that in if you've got questions for Marlon. Thank you so much for sharing these. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, I know the length of time I could talk 
for hours on these flutes, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to get through the most, uh, uh, the main flutes that I have with me. I, mean, I have more right. that I can show, but uh, right. I don't want to take what? up too much time. No, I think I think we're good on time. While people are thinking of questions, you want to pick maybe one um, or a story that you wanted to share that you you haven't yet. Just to give people a. Oh, somebody asks, do you give lessons? <laughs> yeah, I always. Um, when somebody buys one of my flutes, I always offer that. Um, I mean, nowadays we can't really do one on one in person, right. um, but I've always offered. If they want to learn how to play, I'm willing to to show them uh, how to play. And I do have some videos on my YouTube channel, which you can get on my website, uh, of how to play the rimblown flutes. I still have to make one though for make for using that uh, interdental technique, uh, which I should do one one of these days. Uh, but I do show how to play those flutes, and I haven't made one for plant. Uh, learning how to play a, a block flute because there's just so many other videos about how to play a block flute, a bunch of tutorials to play those types of flutes. Uh, so definitely people can go to those. And I know other makers, other flute players offer lessons as well. I'm not sure how much they would charge. Um, flute making and uh, performing is kind of a, a side job. It's more of a hobby because uh, I do have a regular job but I do incorporate uh, this into my, my work. Uh, so I could do it as an outreach project as well. If it's for a, a class or if, we're, if it's for a multiple group of people, I can definitely do that as, as outreach, as a part of my job. So I don't have to charge those people for my lessons. So that's uh, another way that I can do this more freely. Uh, even this type of uh, presentation or even a performance, I can incorporate that as a, an educational outreach through my job. So it definitely helps a lot of organizations that aren't able to pay uh, for me or for those types of services. Right, that's fantastic. Um, somebody asked um, that you'd mentioned um, why Pueblo people play flutes, if you wanted to okay. say Okay, yeah, yeah, that. okay. Um, <clears throat> so with, uh, and this goes for any instruments, uh, and just a quick uh, description of our ceremonies, I guess it's most of our ceremonies are for, um, they center around moisture for, for um, rain or water because we're farmers. You know, many farming cultures have ceremonies that revolve around farming because that's what the farmers need uh, or they revolve around uh, not farming, but uh, rain because they need that water to grow their crops and the crops are what help them survive. Uh, so with many of these ceremonies, um, uh, we, we call certain spirits to come, or we mention certain spirits to come to our ceremonies. And so these flutes will help bring those spirits to the ceremony. So during these ceremonies, you hear the, the flutes, but you never see them. Um, and so for me, that, that's the case, because I've never seen a flute being actually used during a ceremony because it's not for me. The sound is what they want to make. So that's why it's not very important, I guess. Uh, uh, the type of flute that they use, as long as it makes the sound. Um, and so uh, they're, they're essentially to represent the spirits. They're to call in the spirits. Some Pueblos use them to help their corn grow. They, they use them during planting. When they're planting corn or other crops, they'll play a flute song as they're doing it. Um, and I'm sure it was more widespread in the past, ugh, excuse me, than it is now, uh, just because not everybody is into the flutes. You, know, you get modern culture, uh, popular music. Uh, so I think that does have an effect. Of course, uh, we're all into certain things and not everybody's into the flutes. Uh, and I know there's not a whole lot of flute players here in Hamas. Uh, that I know of, uh, only the the ones that are part of certain groups. And uh, since I'm not part of those groups, I don't know what they do. I don't know the ceremonies. I don't know the songs. It, it's, it's their information. And that's how Pueblo culture is, is in general, is uh, many of that information is privileged knowledge. It doesn't belong to everybody. So that's why many Pueblo people will seem very secretive. 
in a way in a, or in a sense we are very secretive uh, because of that because a lot of that information doesn't belong to us so you know we shouldn't be sharing it so that's why a lot of public people won't share a lot of um, the the more secretive uh, or the or more, the more secret ideas or ceremonies that we have to outsiders because of that Thank you for sharing what you what you are sharing tonight. It's it's fantastic. There's a lot of thank yous um, in chat. Um, connected to sort of both traditional and modern use, um, do women play flutes? Is this a, a male only space or? Do so far play? as I know, uh, many of the the traditions that we have here in the pueblo are male uh, dominated ceremonies and groups or societies that uh, that we call them. Uh, you know, many societies here are uh, <clears throat> like medicine societies or hunting societies. Uh, they sometimes involve the women as well. Uh, but so far as to say the women can play the flute during those ceremonies, I don't know because I'm not part of um, those ceremonies. And if, if I were, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you uh, because, you know, like I said, I don't know if they do. But um, it's just something I haven't asked yet. I'm still doing a lot of research um <clears throat> the flutes that i have seen um were part of a group that only uh, males are a part of um so uh as far as i know women don't really play flutes but definitely now with these types of flutes that i've showed you they can there's really no taboo about girls or women playing flutes um i don't I think I know of anybody yet that plays them. I know a few males that play the flute here in the Pueblo, uh, but no females yet. So. Okay, that's interesting. Um, someone's asking about uh, Coco Pelli, um, and if you could say something about um, Coco Pelli, who's usually shown with a flute. Yeah, that's a... Uh, how, how would I say about that? I have, I have mixed feelings about Coco Pelli. It's a very... Um, I mean, I know a lot of people like him, or the idea that has been popularized about him, or them. I'd say them because there's not just one Cocapelli story. There's not just one Cocapelli. The one people are most familiar with has been sort of a, a touristy type of design for made for the tourists. Um, but there isn't just one story about uh, Cocapelli. Um, and even some debate on where that word comes from, but um, most people say that it is a Hopi word, and there are certain uh, spirits uh, or Hopi kachina, kachinas that uh, are a kokopeli sort of a type of spirits, but they don't have a flute. Um, they have different stories. Um, uh, here in Hamas, we don't really have a story about kokopeli. Um, but uh, the most common one is that, um, and the most commonly seen or portrayed flute player design that you may come across here in the Southwest, and there's a lot of them, um, he's depicted, or it is depicted with uh, a large uh, phallus, large penis, uh, which would lead people to believe that it's a sort of a fertility um, um, spirit. It represents fertility. Um, and so there's a story that I know of uh, that I've heard that Coco Pelli was kind of a traveler, traveled from many different places. And uh, I think this is a Hopi story. I'm not too sure, but uh, Coco Pelli was traveling and he comes across this village and he tells the people, um, or no, no, he came across this village and he knew that these that the men of the village were going out to a battle. They're going out to fight some other group. And so right at this time, Cocopelli arrives and tells the men, I'll protect your women uh, while you go, while you guys go out and fight your battle. And so I guess he ends up as the men are gone impregnating a, many of the women that are there. Uh, and so it's sort of uh, you know, a lot of people don't really like to talk about sex and fertility and that type of thing, but it's it's a common thing. We're we're humans. We 
you know, everybody talks about it. But nowadays, it's become more taboo. You don't really, you don't really talk about it. But if you look at a lot of these petroglyphs of flute players, you'll see that a lot of them have phalluses. And not just the flute players, but other just human uh, petroglyphs will have their penises on there. I mean, it's what the guys have. That's how you know it's a guy. It's a man. Um, and so that's uh, at least one part of that story. The other part is that Cocopelli is based off of uh, uh, basically the traveler again coming from Mexico, bringing in all these all this stuff in his bag that's on his back. And what he's holding is not a flute. It's sometimes it's a cane that he's using to walk uh, on the trails, coming up, bringing all this stuff. Uh, another one is that Cocopelli, or at least the flute player design, is that he's hunchbacked. He, he's got a hunchback. Um, and many people, or well, not many, but there is rare occasions that people are like that. So they look, they're hunchbacked. Um, yeah, especially as you get older, the people that have, that they just end up looking like that. Um, and so that person could have been a person that had a hunchback and he just liked playing a flute. Um, or uh, another thing is too is that he's just sitting down and kind of slouched over, and that's how somebody saw him. And depicted him in that design. So there's many different uh, stories that you can go with. Uh, people just tend to choose um, the most popular one or the one that they like. Uh, and it definitely is a, a very uh, interesting design, a very popular design. It's a very pretty design. Um, and there's another one that I like that's very simple. It's actually a, uh, I don't have it with me. I've actually put it on this flute. You can see him right, right there. I've used it as a kind of a flute player star. He's with all along all these other stars, and he's basically it looks like he's sitting down while he's holding that flute up up in the air. So I guess it would be like like that. Or he's and some of the times they're they're laying like this. They're on their backs. They're playing their flutes, sitting down on something. Uh, well, there's many different things, um, and I guess that could be a cocopelli. Um, sometimes they don't have those lines coming up the back of their head, which could be hair, could be feathers, could be all sorts of things. So it's about as much as I know about cocopelli. Uh, I know there's oh, probably really more that you can find, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one other question that I saw, and if anybody else has questions, please put them in chat, um, about your flutes and if you oil your flutes. Um, it depends. Um, sometimes I won't. If they're reed and they're, you, know, you can find reed in big groves that grow back every year. Um, you don't really need to. Because um, a lot of the flutes of the past never were treated with anything. They just used them. And then if it broke, then you go find another one, you make another one. Um, but Putting oil, I've used oil, uh, Danish oil, teak oil works really well. Uh, or even a mixture of um, tree tea oil and uh, lavender. There's certain places that make it. it smells really nice. Tea tree oil is natural uh, disinfectant. Uh, but you can use it as sort of a, 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 a it, gives, it gives it some sort of protection. Um, I use that as well sometimes. I'll also use polyurethane and spray lacquer. Um, now it, it's 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 better to work with those those uh, uh, finishes in the summertime. They dry better, they dry faster than it is in the wintertime because it has to be a certain temperature to use lacquer or uh, polyurethane. This one has polyurethane on it, so it's basically just a layer, a small layer of plastic, uh, which is it's not harmful once it's fully cured. Um, and then I think this one here has spray lacquer on it. I like using spray lacquer because it dries fast and it doesn't take too much time to just spray on the flute. And it comes out really nice and it just it comes out really smooth. You know, other makers will use the same stuff, spray lacquer, uh, polyurethane, but that's pretty much what I use. So. Uh, for finishing. Great. So I, I don't see any other questions coming in um, on the chat. Thank you again uh, for sharing your wisdom, sharing your flutes. Um, this has been fantastic. 
Um, thank you everybody for coming tonight um, to History on Tap. Thank you again to the Los Alamos Creative District for hosting on tap. You can find out all of their upcoming events, um, the Creative District online. You can see what the Historical Society is up to um, online at losalamoshistory.org. Um, Marlon, say your website again so people can check out more if they want to learn more. Okay, well, I have a few uh, announcements. Yeah, please. Uh, <clears throat> please, please. Uh, for Hamas Historic Sites, uh, we normally have the Light Among the Ruins, uh, which happens in December and November. Um, so if you've ever been to that, we set up thousands of fardelitos on the ruins of the, of the village and the church. <clears throat> it's a very popular event, but we're not able to have it this year. So what we're doing instead is doing some more virtual uh, events. Um, if, if you go to our Facebook page, I don't know if many of you have Facebook, uh, New Mexico Historic Sites is the page where we're putting all these events for December in, in place of our December events. So they're all virtual now. There's a lot of videos that are going up now. Uh, you can also find those at our website, nmhistoricsites.org. And uh, you'll be able to find that there. That's the, uh, uh, I forgot, the, I think season. No, traditions, I don't remember, Seasonal Traditions of New Mexico. There you go. That's what it's called, Seasonal Traditions of New Mexico. And so for Hamas Historic Site, we're going to have an event on December 19th. And it's going to include a short concert from me. So I'm going to pre-record a few songs that I've played on my flute. And after I perform... Uh, a group that we usually have for our performances or for our events at Hamas Historic Site, a seasonal dance group from Hamas Pueblo, uh, they're going to do a, a buffalo dance at the end. Uh, and this is all going to come out on December 19th. So if you're all on Facebook that day, uh, it'll be on Facebook and it'll also be on our website. Uh, even if you miss it that day, you can, it'll, it'll be up there for uh, forever, I guess. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's what I'm currently working on is the, 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 the dancers and I still have to perform my concert. So I haven't done that yet. Um, but if you want more information about the flutes, uh, marlinmagdalena.com, just my name. Um, and you can find more information about uh, the flutes that I've talked about. So a few that I didn't really get to, uh, but it's all there. If you, I can't really see, I can't really sell anything, but I can say that I do take orders. You can find information about that on the website or on my website. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. And thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to us or listening to me. And I hope you were able to learn something. And I hope you join us for our future events at Hamas Historic Sites. Fantastic. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you all so much for coming. And thank you so much, Marlon, for, for sharing tonight. Oh yeah. Oh, really right. quick. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have performances from this summer on my website, or not my well, on my website and New Mexico Historic Sites website. So if you missed those, the virtual summer camp, I did eight videos of myself uh, performing eight different songs. So if you want to check that out, it's on the website now. Um, uh, NMHistoricSites.org uh, on Hamas Historic Site. Uh, virtual yeah, summer. They're camp. fantastic. The, that virtual summer camp is fantastic. It's definitely worth checking out. So if you guys enjoyed tonight's, go and check those out. And the event on the 19th um, sounds great. We're looking forward to that too. Okay. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great evening. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>